Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you are well. And can I welcome you back to the uh, the last presentation of our uh, of our fantastic uh, ministry, our family ministries program. And I want to welcome you as well out there who are uh, in the internet. Hope that you are enjoying the programs as much as we have here. Um, before we start, we are going to pray, and I'm going to ask you wherever you are to please bow your heads, close your eyes, and pray with us. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to minister to each other, to learn more and more about how we as a family, both in our nuclear situations and as an extended family in the church, can be supportive and loving and patient with each other. Help us, Lord, to have your spirit in our lives. We know that you modeled the church after the family that you want us to be. Help us, dear Lord, to be the people you want us to be and be a light to those around. So in Jesus' name, we ask you to bless the speakers this evening and may all go according to your glory and purpose and honor. In Jesus' name, we praise you. Amen. As we continue, we are going to uh, start off with uh, a little bit of praise and worship. We're going to sing some beloved hymns. And one that I find really dear to my heart is Lead Me to Calvary, King of My Life, I Crown Thee Now. Hymn 317, if you've got your Seventh-day Adventist hymnal. That's 317. I just want to thank uh, our musicians again for being here to support us. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget, lest I forget thy thorn crowned brow. Lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Second verse, show me the tomb. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid. Tenderly mourned and wept. Angels? Angels in robes of light arrayed guarded thee whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget. Verse 3, let me like Mary, let me like Mary through the gloom, come with a gift to thee, show to me now the empty tomb, lead me, lead me to Calvary, lest I forget, lest I forget, get saved. verse, may I be willing, Lord, may I be willing, Lord, to share daily my cross for thee, even thy cup of grief to thou hast borne all for me, lest I forget, lest I forget, forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love. 
Let's sing that chorus one more time, please. Lead me to Calvary. Let's I forget. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget mine agony. Lest I forget thy No, we have to be thankful and praise God that it didn't all end on the cross, even though that sacrifice was so efficacious, I think is the word, and that it paid the price for our sins. It went beyond there, and he rose. Amen? And I have a deep knowledge that my Lord lives and that he has a personal relationship available to all of us. Okay, so let us sing together. Hymn 251, 251. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is willing, whatever men may say.
And the last one, because of the fact that he lives, we're going to sing hymn 214. 214. We have this hope. And I'd like you to stand for this one, please. Even at home, please stand. She's going to sing the first verse twice. We have this hope. one more time. It's a great joy and privilege to welcome you back this afternoon. We few, we band of brethren who will not be moved, though the heavens may fall. Thank you for staying back and enjoying. And I see a fresh face coming, a blow in from Nottingham. Lovely to see you. I shan't single anybody else out. Very good to have you here. Well, I had a wonderful morning. I don't know about you guys online. I, I know the rest of the congregation thoroughly enjoyed being here in this live setting. And we, I was, I don't know, I've been in ministry for so long, it's difficult to inspire me. But this brother, Brother Aki, thank you, sir. God bless you and your ministry. I'm still waiting for John to do it, but uh, anyway, he's still young enough to, to crack it. <laughs> thank you. Lovely to see you. Thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy this afternoon. I'm sure you will. And we will be here. If you have any questions and answers, if there's any way of sending us a text through, we, we will do our bit. And of course, the congregation here, we have a Q&A session. So thank you. Welcome. You are in the right place at the right time. So I'll hand over now to Pastor, uh, well, to Sean. I think Sean is going to bless us with a song.
actually congregation I'm going to ask that you bless me with a song we're all going to sing together hymn 338 redeemed how I love to proclaim it redeemed by the blood of the lamb we can't really sing enough about the pure joy there is in knowing that we do not have to worry about eternal damnation. We don't have to worry about that sort of thing because we know that God is love and that we have given our lives to him and that he will give us such joy for eternity. So can I invite you to turn to him 338. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. I'm going to ask every voice in here to sing. I'd love to hear you and encourage me. Thank you. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed am I the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercies, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, 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 redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, his child and forever I am. Verse 2, I think. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Oh, redeemed, 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 redeemed. Proclaim it, his child, and forever I am. Verse 3 I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose love I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the Let's sing that chorus one more time. Child and forever. I'm redeemed, 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 redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. His child and forever I am. Amen. Thank you for blessing us. everyone. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. And what we're going to just do now is just... Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. We're just going to um, have a quick review of the week. I don't know how many of you... How many have been watching online? Let me just see by your hands. So you've watched online. Okay. And of course, we've had our people coming in each night to to help support the um, the speaker. And you know something, this has been, I'd say it's been an absolutely brilliant week, but it's been a difficult week. Why do I say it's been a difficult week? It's been a difficult week because it's been a difficult subject. It's a subject that it's not had much discussion. I think we all know because of the lockdown a lot of people suffered a lot with their mental health there have been reports on the news of children suffering with mental health 
And so when the G's, we didn't know what the subject, every year they send a different subject for the, um, the family plan book. Every year it's different. Last year it was resilience, this year it was families and mental health. And it couldn't have come at a better time because it's, it's something that we really do need to discuss. And so we've been so thankful for the different speakers that have come night after night. Our dear pastor here. You started it all off for us, didn't you? And you laid the foundation. You know, can you just tell us a little bit about what you were trying to lay that foundation? Yeah, I, I, th I think initially our main purpose on, on Sabbath was really to focus on the fact that despite what problems we have, there is always hope in God. And despite what situations we face, God is there to carry us through those things. But at the same time, we sometimes do need outside help. What we mean by that, it's not sufficient to say to people, I'm just going to pray for you and just let's pray about it and everything's going to be okay. There are times we need to discuss those problems with a professional um, counselor, someone which can guide us when we're going through those challenges and help us to work through those situations and you develop techniques to, to deal with things. And sometimes as a church, I myself was one of those people. I used to believe, you know, we Adventists, we Christians, why do we need counseling? But because of life experience as well, in my own experience, I have realized that it is very, very important. And there are times when sometimes the issues are so great um, that you do need, and Christian counseling is good because obviously you, you have somebody who is sharing, you know, has, has some faith, has a belief, but even, not, even if that is not the case, get some support. Never suffer in silence. And sometimes just knowing somebody is there praying with you and working with you can be a great, a great help. But the main purpose is in everything we can come to God for support because the Lord, when even sometimes individuals can't always, we can't always share everything, we can tell God, can't we? And God will give us, you know, the grace and carry us through. And when you combine that, great things can happen. And there's always possibilities. And one of the things I've always believed in my life is that there are always possibilities. We never have to give up. Um, and sometimes when you're on your lowest ebb, that's when a breakthrough can come. So a glimmer of hope is worth carrying on and, and never giving up. And, and that's a philosophy I always, I always have in my life. Yeah, I'm just going to say that I'm not going to necessarily go through every single night just picking and going through. But what I will do is just sort of highlight some of the things um, that I was able to glean from some of the different nights. And as I'm speaking, I'm going to give you an opportunity to share as well. So if anybody would like to share from a particular night, there was something, you know how it is when you've heard a presentation, there's one thing that sticks out in your mind. There was an illustration or something that may have been given that you um, have particularly remembered. So be prepared you know, when I give you that opportunity to, to just share with us if there was just one thing that you took away from that presentation, whether it was when you was here or whether it was watching on, online. So we, we know we were so thankful to have um, Pastor Kumi um, come and join us on Sunday night. He spoke about living with a spouse with mental illness. And, you know, for that evening, it was not just about a spouse. It could be any family member. And it was something that was a very difficult thing to, you know, for, for people to come to terms with. And I think the main message was that person will need to seek some support, need to seek help. Um, Monday, Dr. Beatrice, she spoke about um, the mental effects of grief. And I think one of the main things I picked up from her message was so interesting. I think the main thing for me was just to ask. She said she kept, when we were doing the question and answer session, she said, ask. Ask the person. And sometimes you, you, you are never sure of what to say to a person, when to say it. You don't want to make them cry or, or get angry or anything like this. But the fact is, just ask the person. 
And the thing is, with grief, I think from the one thing I picked up from Dr. Beatrice was the fact that everyone will go through that grieving process in their own individual way. There's no set way to, to, to grieve. I don't know if anyone has anything they'd like to share from, from Sabbath, Sunday, and Monday. Anybody want to share anything from those three nights? Okay. Yeah. Okay, if we just have a mic. It's just here on the front. Yeah, thank you. I just want to share with you what the Apostle Paul says, that, um, that we do not grieve like others who do not have hope, but that our hope is in, in Christ Jesus, that when he comes again, that we'll have a eternal life. This is, we're only pilgrims and sojourners in this world, but we have a, a heavenly kingdom to look forward to, so we, we just keep hold on to the blessed hope in Christ Jesus, and we'll be able to go through that grieving po process and get things in perspective. Thank you, thank you. So then on Tuesday, Pastor Aquiza spoke about shaping your child's worldview through modeling, teaching, and ministering. And there he talked about those three points of, um, you know, educating through modeling, daily teaching, and the importance of ministering and allowing your children to experience ministering. And I, I think that is so true that we... Um, as a church, we have our adventures, we have our pathfinders, but getting them involved in other activities. You know, even when I remember when different churches organised, I know some churches did stuff for the um, the Jubilee, and they invited, I know that they invited the community in, and they had to go and let the community know that they were putting on this meal. And so it was a, an event where the whole church was asked to come one afternoon and help knock on doors, drop leaflets through, and that's something that the children can be involved in. So wherever possible, it's, it was so important to um, practice what we preach and get those children involved in ministry. And then on um, Wednesday, Karen Holford spoke about discipline, uh, disciplining our children with love. Um, I must say we had, a, I can remember the questions on that night, we hadn't awful lot of questions come in on that night. That was a very interesting one. But um, she was basically saying, I think from what I was able to pick up from that night, the importance of communicating with your children from a very young age. It's so easy when the baby is to have that close connection and then as they get older, sometimes that connection with the children can sometimes not be as strong. And it's, it's important to know your child so well that you are able to, um, you know, teach them in a, love, in a loving way. Um, and so, anybody got anything they would like to share from Tuesday or Wednesday from um, the meetings? Anyone want to share anything? Yeah, we've got a hand here. Pastor Aki is here. Yeah, ju just to... <laughs> Just to add to the, the idea of, of children in ministry, um, we believe and we are instructed that children are able to uh, understand their, their relationship with Christ. They're able to uh, appreciate um, salvation. And that means that, that they can give their hearts to the Lord. And if they can give their hearts to the Lord, they can also receive spiritual gifts. And if children can receive spiritual gifts we have to be able to create opportunities for them to exercise those gifts. Mm. I think part of the mm. problem that we have within the church is that oftentimes we underestimate um, our children and we don't challenge them mm. um, and we don't create the opportunities for them to, to exercise and to, to spread their wings in terms of, of uh, ministry. And if we don't do that, by the time they reach the, the, the age, the, the adult years or the teenage uh, later years, um, they have no foundation for mm -hmm. getting involved in ministry. It's like a, a, a big leap from doing nothing to all of a sudden we want them to be out there and, 
um, witnessing in, in public. It's, it's a gradual process that we mm. need to lead children through. So the home is a place where we help them to understand their talents and their abilities and help them to discover their giftedness mm. and, and then create the opportunities for them to, to exercise those gifts. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Um, on Thursday, uh, it was Judy Clements who spoke about um, the impact of sexual abuse on children. Now, I think for this particular night, it was so important that she went through the different stages of what is sexual abuse. She talked about how we can, I think this was such an important seminar, how we can safeguard our children. And I think as a church, we need to have more discussions on this because, um, you know, the last thing we want to do is um, put our children in a situation where they're vulnerable. And so it's about educating the children. I think this was one of the things that came out, educating the children from a very young age about their different body parts, the correct terminology, and um, making sure that you have a close connection with them so that if there's anything wrong with them, you will be able to spot it. You will notice there's that they're not behaving in the same way. And so you can, you know, hopefully um, avoid having to deal with the after effects of a child being abused. And then on, of course, on Friday, Adam Ramden, um, the manly way to lead, talking about, that, that was a, I mean, very interesting seminars all through the week. You know, the manly way to lead, it was talking, that one thing I wrote here, um, true leadership gives. That was one point he made. True leadership gives. And the fact is, Christ is our true example of, a, of the greatest leader that was out, but he was always prepared to sacrifice for the needs of others. And I think um, we are naturally selfish, but as we ask and pray to the Lord to be with us and to help us, hopefully we can you know, model the, the sort of people he needs us to be. So anyone got any final comments now before we move on? Any final comments from the week and from the sessions? Okay. But one thing I will say, the, the res the, these um, YouTube videos are, are there now as a resource. I would encourage all family life leaders, they could perhaps just play the video, they could have their own discussions, they could create their own question box. There may be questions within their own churches that they need to go into and discuss a lot a little bit more so it's an opportunity now to use this resource within your churches so that everyone can feel supported and everyone can feel loved so thank you for that time and I'm going to pass back over okay Delavon yes thanks for that um what we're going to do now is we uh, you can see we we're doing things a little differently um this afternoon we are actually now set up to create our panel for this afternoon and this is going to be made up with some slight discussion and also we are going to look at some questions and answers and maybe you want to participate with this as well so we want you to be involved just got to reposition things a little bit just to make it a little bit easier if we move up maybe one better one and then we've got uh you know, can start inviting our guests to come and join us. So I'm going to ask Pastor Aki to come up first, so you can come and sit. Um, uh, Dr. Les Aki to come and be part of our panel. I don't think he needs much more introduction from this morning. <laughs> so it's good to have him and his experience here. And myself and Delavon, as you know, even prior to ministry, both of us are fully trained, um, certified family life educators. So we do a lot of work with couples, young people, relationships, communication, conflict resolution, and a range of, of, of um, other areas that we look at. Mainly our passion is mainly within relationships and people having a better way of finding ways to communicate with each other and learning to say things a bit nicer sometimes, <laughs> you know, because that is what often causes problems. And sometimes how we hear things is really the big issue. And that's why there can be so much misunderstanding. 
and conflict which can be resolved if we just take a bit of time to sometimes discuss. Um, I'm also happy as well to have, have Jean Gregory to come and if you want to come and join us, Jean. Um, Jean is also a counsellor. She's, she's one of our counsellors. I know volunteers look a bit for our NEC counselling as well. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I was getting a bit worried. <laughs> so uh, and um, Jean mainly specialises it mainly mental health. Jean, you and I well, I've got a background in in mental health, so I'm an RMN, and and uh, I was a mental health social worker as well, and I was an ASW for a period of time. That's someone that sections people under the Mental Health Act. But I'm also uh, a person, a person-centred psychotherapist. Got a master's in that, and I am a member of the BACP. Thank you. Thank you, G. Somebody's asking what BAC British Association of Counselling and Psychotherapists. Okay, now I don't know if Des has arrived. I know he was travelling in. Is it? Oh, Des, I, just, I didn't even see. You've done very well because he's come all the way from um, Rochdale, isn't it? And we, we in the NEC, I have... Um, a team of volunteers which form the NEC Family Ministries Advisory Committee. Um, a lot of them are very committed to many things, um, but Des has, has volunteered to be one of them to come up today. And I know, Des, you do a lot of work with mental health, isn't it? Thank you. Yes, um, I do a lot of uh, volunteering, as you mentioned, um, don't have any qualification at all, so just to bring a balance to the team. <laughs> but uh, just the willingness to be there for anybody who needs that helping hand. Thank you very much, Des. I know his wife as well, Pauline, is very actively involved with our NEC prayer ministries and part of the area, area two. I was yeah, there was yeah area area two team. So it's so good that, that you could be with us here today. I also have um, Natalie, who, Natalia, sorry. Why am I saying this? Sorry, Natalia, sorry about that. Natalia, um, please come up, uh, Natalia. Um, she is a wife, mother, and counselor. And her passion is to bring hope and to renew the minds of wounded people from all walks of life. Now, we met Na um, Natalia here um, when we came, I think we visited, uh, we was visiting here. Just We always like to come to a church before we do a, a program. And we came and we, we met and we chatted. And I just felt impressed to invite her to be a part of this, this week because I felt what she was doing really is very needed, is really needed now. Um, she actually runs her own private counselling practice for young people and adults and it specialises in depression, anxiety, um, mommy burnout, <laughs> addiction, self-esteem, bereavement, relationships, breakups and family and marriage. Um, Natalie also runs a ministry called Christ Therapy and I don't know if we're able to put that up on the screen, we did send a link. Um, which anyone both online and here can access. Um, and this brings a safe space into our churches where people are free to explore and express their feelings without judgment on, on specific topics, pertinent topics to them. Natalia also runs an online group counseling programs on bereavement, self-esteem, and much more. Um, and if you're interested in getting more information regarding the counseling or Christ therapy, then please look at that link, it's up there, photograph it, and that would be a, a resource because part of the, the work as a conference, we don't have the answers to everything. I know I said that I've said a lot about our counselling service. It is the best we can offer at this moment in time. It, it is at least there. It's very much a telephone service. There are volunteers, and we, we appreciate the volunteers we have. We obviously want to expand it. People have said they want face-to-face. -face. People have said they want would like somewhere to come. We're not at that stage yet. We can only go where we are. The SEC has had a bit longer <laughs> in developing, and it's taken them years. But we thank God we have something. But as a conference, we cannot necessarily answer everything, but we can put some support there, and we could also link with other organizations. I also link up with another 
Christian counseling group who are run by an Adventist as well. And if you ring us at the office, if you call myself or my department, we will also try and refer you and get you some support when it's needed. No one is turned away. And I do have a lot of calls from time to time. And we are here to try and help. But unfortunately, the reality is, as a conference, we cannot physically do everything. <laughs> but at least if we could support or at least signpost, that is also a service as well. And please, you've, you've got the number now for the counselling service. Make use of it. Our team of counsellors are very dedicated and they will help where they can. And, you know, that is always available. And we, and we praise God for that. Th this, this afternoon, I, I want it to be, I guess, as informal as possible, but as to be able to look at real-life issues. You know, when, when we talk about family ministries... Um, oftentimes people see family ministries as, you know, husband, wife, is it 2.5 or three children? <laughs> you can correct me on this. <laughs> that is how we see the, the typical family because that's, I guess, how we wired. But the reality is um, the church is made up with many different families. And some of those families may not be what we would class as typical families. What do I mean by that? Um, they may be single parents, may have never married, just, just in the church. Had the, some have had the kids in the church, some are outside. There are, there are divorce, couples' divorces hit many families and cause a lot of pain and hurt. There is bereaved families, widowed families. Um, there are so many different variations but guess what? The beauty of faith is that wherever we are, we can find a place of hope, of comfort, and reassurance. And one, one thing I always say to people, uh, even if you may be on your own and struggling with your children, it's not just about, um, you may not have your spouse there for whatever reason, but as a church, that is part of your family. And we are supposed to support one another, isn't it? That's what we've been talking about in the lesson this week. So all of this is very, very important. It's very real. So w we just want you to just think about the different sort of families in church and see how we could minister to those various needs. Now, I am not so familiar with our church here. You may be more familiar than me, <laughs> um, Natalia, but, but I, I know... Our church here in Mansfield may have a mix, I don't know. Each church is different, you know. Um, we also have the older folks in church who maybe for whatever reason, maybe their spouses are no longer there, they're on their own, they need support, don't they? You know, how can we minister to those? That is what we are looking at here. Um, within our, I'm going to just share one element, if I may, from our um, Family Ministries Plan book this year. And it, it's done by um, our GC directors, um, uh, Willie and Elaine Oliver, and the team. And they had a section in there, Hope in the Face of Divorce. Divorce is something which has hit families. And I'm going to share with you a, a question, but it just helps us to think about the processes which happen. And I'm going to kind of share how they answered this and just highlight a few things and then we'll move on to some other, as a team, we will move on to some other things here. And the question was asked, after 10 years of marriage, my husband just asked for a divorce. We disagree about almost everything we speak about. As a Christian, however, I know divorce is not God's plan. I've asked my husband to join me in counseling to find solutions to our dilemma, but sadly, he isn't interested. We have two children in school, and I am very concerned um, will this, how this would affect them if we get divorce. And this was sent in by somebody and the, the, the next statement just says, please help. 
What would you say to somebody in that situation? Challenging. So I think what would be really good, if bearing in mind that scenario, if uh, we've got two mics here, I think what would be really useful if we can sort of look at this from two aspects. Look at what's happening there, and this is a, a real life situation. I'm sure all of you here know of someone who, I who has just gone through a divorce, who is just starting the process of going through divorce. We've all got people, I know of people right now um, who are unfortunately just coming out of a divorce. And so what I'm saying is, let's just have a discussion about, you know, if the panel members, if I can pass this mic on in a minute. Um, I want to talk about what's going to be going on with the husband and the wife in that situation, but also what's going to be happening with those children. What are, we're talking about mental health, aren't we? So can you just share? Um, there's a few things that mm. happen in there, um, but I guess in all honesty, with what the, the wife is saying, I guess you can't force someone to stay married to you. So mm. that's the first thing. It's coming to a place of acceptance of, it's very unfortunate, but for whatever reason, my husband don't want to be married to me anymore. Okay. Mm. So I'm not saying like necessarily to get divorced, but if I was speaking to this lady, I would advise her to maybe go into counselling first off, to mm. find somewhere confidential where she can really offload mm. and talk. And that's going to be very painful. Anyone who's married, you'd know what that's like, you know. Being married, imagine your spouse turns around and says, I don't want to be with you anymore, with no explanation. And then you've got young children in school, mm. so they're under a certain age. So the first thing, if it was me, God forbid, if it was me, I would get myself into counselling first mm. off and just unpick the stress and the hurt that I'm going through. I just try and get myself mm. just in a healthy state to be able to deal with whatever is going to happen, whether they stay together or they don't stay together. The best thing is for you to get counselling personally first, yeah. then you're in a fit stage to deal with whatever your husband comes with next. Next thing I would do is be honest with the children. I would. I'd be honest with them. Um, it depends how long it's been, maybe not straight away, but if that's how it's looking to move forward, like they're not going to be this family anymore and daddy's going, maybe not tell them the full details, but I would just say, you know, mommy and daddy, unfortunately, we're not going to be together anymore. And this is what it's going to look like. But we both still love you, but mm. they need to know because sometimes when daddy disappears or mommy or whoever, the kids are sitting there thinking, well, what did I do? Yeah. They can blame themselves. And then they start feeling abandoned, thinking, oh, it must have been something that I've done, or why have my friends still got their mum and dad? Why don't I have my mum and dad? I'm speaking from my own experience. I grew up without a father in my home, and I always questioned why he wasn't there for me. And it's something that I still live with now. Like, coming into this faith, you know, um, having an etern and having a heavenly father, it's like you, you're learning how to have that father's love. But when you've never had it, or if you've experienced your dad being taken away from the home for whatever reason, it has a massive impact on children. And they take on so much, but we can go into detail about that later. Uh, just to add to what Natalia said, because I think she's absolutely right. There are some counselling agencies, uh, Relate is one of them, that will work not only with the couple, but they will work with you even if one side of that couple wants the counselling and the other doesn't. Mm -hmm. So you can go to relate as an individual. This person could go to relate and uh, unpick what is what is going on uh, because you do need that space. And it may well be that once you've had that counselling, as Natalia said, that you're in a better position for you both to to come together to talk and also. The, the husband in this scenario could go on his own to relate and that might that might work so if they both separately go to, to, to relate and then come together as a couple um, that that might be a way forward um, I think children tend to have a, a fair enough idea of that something's wrong mm. 
So um, sometimes as parents, we want to behave as if the children, you know, haven't heard or they're not going. But actually, children will know there's something wrong. They might not know exactly what's wrong, but they will have an idea. Mm. And it's about how you actually manage that. For some children, um, um, too much information is not good for them because they then go away and worry separately about it. If you're going to approach the children to say what is going on, then the couple need to do it together. There needs to be joint responsibility communicating to the children because the children need to see that there's at least that amount of unity between you. Mm -hmm. And also, you also don't want a situation of, well, you tell my children this and you tell my children that. You don't want that situation. Mm. So there does need to be uh, you know, that clarity. The other thing that springs to mind with this for me is male mental health. That sometimes, um, in, uh, in the scenario, I can't remember exactly what you said, but the, 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 the husband didn't want to talk about it and it was this abrupt end. You know, relationships, as Natalia said, are difficult. They are complicated. Mm -hmm. It can be very difficult. And often relationships didn't get to this point overnight. There's been a deterioration in communication, mm -hmm. in understanding one another. You know, that, that, that term vibe that was in the relationship has gone. Mm -hmm. And for some people, and, and sometimes for men, who often may find it difficult to express their feelings, and try to express their feelings and, and then there's an argument and you don't want an argument so you don't say what you feel and it can be a bit of a vicious circle. Sometimes for us, we don't, as human beings, we don't want an argument so we decide, right, that's it. I need this to end. And maybe that's the scenario. And he may, he may well be suffering from depression, which is just another feature of it. So there's a lot of things that could be going on, um, but you won't know definitely until that's been explored and counselling is probably the best way forward. Mm. Um, agree with everything that's been said. Um, in a couple of points in terms of the children, the question is often asked, should, should couples stay together for the sake of the children? Um, the answer to that is couples should stay in a healthy relationship for the sake of the children because you have to think about what is being modelled to those children. Um, when they grow up and they get into their own relationships, if they have been taught uh, dysfunctional dynamics within, within a couple relationship, they're going to take that into their own relationships. Mm -hmm. So it's vitally important for um, couples to stay together, but stay together in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. If they do decide to divorce, we also there is no getting away from the fact that children are going to suffer the fallout from that divorce. Mm -hmm. But what will mitigate some of that um, negative effect is if the couple learn how to get along with each other in spite of the fact that they've decided that they're not going to live their lives together. Mm. Um, because it's when, when couples split and then they're at hammers and tongs with each other, that really compounds the pain that, that the children will experience. Mm. So, yeah. I was about seven, seven years old when my, my parents divorced. And I remember we had to move from one to another alternatively at different stages. And whoever wa was not present is the one we miss the most. Mm. If we were with mom, we wanted to be with dad. If we were with dad, we wanted to be with mom. Mm. And it was such a conflict. And s at some stage, you start to feel guilty to say almost comparing them to each other, if you like. Mm. But as even now, I seem to recall that that process, uh, we didn't fully understand it. Mm. So I, I, don't, I don't know how much or how, how well children can ever really adapt to not having another parent at, um, mm. uh, at home. Um, but it is a common thing now, today, that is happening more and more, as you highlighted there, that mm. the dynamics of the family structure is changing. Mm. What may be useful and what was useful for us uh, growing up, we had loving grandparents who seemed to almost take the impact of what was happening 
And they seemed to almost shield us from all of that because they were so loving and they were so caring. And up until now, I, pre I, I literally see them as my first parents because of everything that was happening. Mm. That's an extension of the family unit that you were talking about, I, I believe, where not just the, the immediate family, mom and dad, but the, the church family can, t uh, can play a part because those children are going to be growing up and they're going to be part of a, co a connection or a network of people who may be able to hopefully, hopefully um, sort of take, take away some of that impact uh, and, and they, are, they are loved within that church setting. And, and I think it's, it's important for us to recognize that these are things that even if somebody, even if people don't come forward and share with us what's going on in their homes, these are things that are happening within our churches and we should, mm. we should just be kind and caring and compassionate as much as we can be because you never know how much that will help that person and that child who's within your church. Mm. Thank you for that, brother, because it just made me think of another thing, which is that we need to be careful that we don't put our children in a position where they're having to keep a secret and nobody knows about it and they don't really know what to say. And, y you know, as adults, these are adult choices and adult decisions. As adults, we need to protect the children in that relationship. So if something is to be explained, they, as adults, we explain it. We don't put our children in a position that they're left feeling uncomfortable and scared to say the truth. I was just um, just thinking that, you know, it's it's such an awful thing to have to go through. Um, and I think I don't know, you know, in, in every church, we really have to find someone because some people feel they can't go to counselling, but what I'm saying is you need someone that, that you can confide in, that you can trust um, that is a good friend, that knows you well, that you can um, have as a friend. Because what I'm thinking is, sometimes when there's something happening like this, there's so many people who can sometimes come on by and they're, as it were, try to console you because oh, I'm sorry to hear such and such. And some people are sadly wanting information and about what's happened why it happened who did what did they do did they go off and and to be honest you don't need to have people coming to you wanting all the nitty-gritty that's not what you need that's not what you need that's not helpful and I know that has happened in some cases where there are people that are approaching people who are going through that sort of a situation wanting all the nitty-gritty that's not what you need to 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 be surrounded by and I think if you have somebody that can be um, I mean I think I think two things I mean as family ministries we always say take time with your relationships before you get to that stage sorry I always like to think about prevention let me just say a little bit about the prevention I know we're talking about divorce here but for those who are married who's married here just give me a wave who's married Quite a number. Good. Okay. One thing I'll say: I, I love prevention. I, I like. I'm. I've experienced divorce in my family. And the thing about. Oh sorry, I'll get to my prevention in a minute. But the thing about divorce, it affects so many people. Mm, it does. So many people on so many different levels. You know, I think about a stone being thrown into a lake. You you see those ripple effects going out. That's how a divorce affects everybody. Sometimes those children suffer so much. They're not able to sometimes interact with grandparents who they'd normally go and visit. They, those grandparents have missed out on the upbringing of those children. Sometimes cousins, they don't get to see the cousins that they'd know. Sometimes big family gatherings that they used to go to. Sometimes when you've got a divorce and you were friends with another couple, sometimes that relationship's been severed now. Because now you're divorced, they were friends with this, the, your husband, and now you... And there, mm. this is what I'm trying to say. So many broken relationships. But what I want to just quickly say about prevention, please, when you're married, you start off, and it's wonderful. 
the sky is blue. When you first get married, the sky is blue. It's true, isn't it? Isn't it a beautiful shade of blue? And the sun is shining and the flowers are growing. And there's all, the birds are singing in the tree. You know what I'm talking about here. I'm creating that one. You're in love. Everything's wonderful. <laughs> but then the practicalities of life start coming in. You know, the children start coming in. The pressures. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to you next. You can have the mic next. You know, sorry. But the pressures of bringing up the children. You've got mortgages to pay. You've got bills. You've got shoes to find. All of this starts coming in. And then you... You start taking each other for granted. So what I say is, yes, enjoy each other, love each other. But what you do, you find your grandparents or your aunties, or whoever it is, and you say, once a month, can you just babysit for us, please? Seriously, you have to make it a serious... I'm, I'm so serious about this. Please, I'm begging you. Find somebody that you trust, and I have to say that, trust, that you trust... You know, the other night we talked about sexual abuse, and it happens where? Mainly from somebody that the child knows. God forbid that it's somebody that you thought you trusted, but somebody that you know you trust, okay? Let them babysit. They love to babysit for you. And then you and your husband take time out. Take time out to talk to each other, to have fun, you know? Laugh together, have fun together. Have that dating experience together. That's how you safeguard your marriage from all of these things that are coming in. Satan doesn't want marriages to work. He wants to, he wants to rip marriages apart. He will do everything he can to destroy our marriages. We have to strengthen our marriages. Fight for our marriages. Pray. Pray for our husbands and our spouses when things are tough. Pray. Ask God for wisdom to know how to deal with some of the situations you're experiencing in your marriage. Yes. I was just, I just wanted to expand on what you were saying just there because, um, you know, with the children, uh, as that child who is a part of that single parent household, um, I don't know about you guys, how your lives were when you were children, but I'm telling you, it has such a big impact on the children. Some things can be good, because you can end up becoming empathic and caring about people. Um, but sometimes you can end up taking on burdens that you shouldn't be taking on at your little age. You can end up seeing the bills come through the, e through, through the letterbox and wondering how we're going to pay the bills. Mm. And then kissing your mum at night time while she goes off to do a night shift. And you're looking after your, 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 your little bro brothers and sisters. It's like you've got to grow up. Mm. Like, mm. you become an adult before your time. Mm. And I'm not saying this is the case for everyone, but I'm just speaking from experience. Many times the children just get neglected. Mm. And then because the parent who is taking on the household, that single parent, they're having to work. They're having to clean the house. Think about it. They're not getting no break, Yeah. This whole, like, they have the whole burden of the household on their own. So they're not able to be emotionally available to their children. And then the children miss out because when they're going to mom to tell her certain things, mom's not even all there. She's not there. And she loves you, but she can't support you emotionally because she's broken herself like she needs that support that that's why God said it's not good for man to be alone because we share each other's burdens and we have that place where we can can go to express and be adored and feel loved you know but when the dynamics change and it's just you on your own it's it's really really sad and I personally I'm thinking practical ways of what we could do as a church I think if we know any single mothers or single fathers we should invite them around for um, Sabbath lunch that's what I think. That's a practical thing you could do. Or when you're baking your bread, bake an extra loaf for that family. Or if you see the children and, and you've got a close relationship with them, you can offer to take them to the park if you live close by. I'm just thinking, like, practically, how can we help these people? Because at the end of the day, pastors, you, you, you guys should know this scripture about the widows, the fatherless. That's, right. That's what we're supposed to do. We're meant to show love practical love of how you know we can support each other and literally be like a family 
Amen. Some good points. Um, I can see someone's got their hand up. So we got in these mics. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just in answer to Natalia's question, we've been studying to in the Sabbath school onto the least of of these, of these and mm-hmm. that includes the the fatherless, mm-hmm. the widow, and the poor people. And we have to be follow Jesus' example of being selfless and. Um, developing a Christ-like character. But I will just want to show you what Jesus said about divorce in, from the Bible. Because um, It says in Matthew 19, verse 8, Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not so, not this way from the beginning. That's from the New International Version. But the New Living Translation of Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, that it was not what God had originally intended. Mm. Just a very quick one. It is important to understand the consequences. Mm. You're breaking a vow to somebody, but first of all, you're breaking a vow to God. Mm. What God has joined, let no man put it under. Secondly, it affects the family, as you say. It affects the church. It affects the community. It affects the world. Blended families try, but that was not God's blend. And so I think when we get to the scenario, it seems to me to be the end of the road. But I think the point's made here, singling out someone who can act, they, they are prepared to listen to and speak with them and say, have you counted the cost? What is involved? Do you love your children? And okay, Jesus said to the children of Israel, I'm going to make you jealous. I'm going to bless them and get you back through that me- method. Maybe we need to put a bit of uh, guilt somewhere in there to say, what is the consequence? Do you really want to carry that guilt? I don't know. I've had a few years in the journey, but never mind. Thanks. Okay, th- thank you. Some some very um, pertinent comments have been made, and I think just as we sort of move on, because we, we don't want to just dwell too long on this, we, we use this as it, divorce and these issues are part of our mental well-being. You know, this is why we're mentioning it. Um, it was very interesting what... Willie and Leilani have shared in part of their answer, and of course, Matthew 19 was quoted, but also the reality is, in some cases, it happens, and for those, we need to bring support and healing, as has been said, all of those things need to happen. But I think, it's ideally, it's not God's ideal, and I always say there's always hope if both are prepared to work at it, and that does take time, and it's a journey, and you do need outside um, help, but I just found this point was raised here in this comment, which I thought was very good, and it was talking about the pain of divorce and why couples shouldn't give up because relationships don't come perfect. They may start off good, but we've got to have disagreements. And you know what we say in conflict management: it's not so much the disagreement, but it's how you handle it and learning how to talk to each other better to work through it. And making up is good, you know, (laughs) if you can learn how to deal with situations. And it was using the the example, many couples become discouraged when they spend most of their conversations disagreeing with each other. We understand that, but we encourage couples, however, to see their marriage as a tooth that has a cavity there is a pain and deterioration because of the lack of proper maintenance. Because the reason why you've got in that situation is because you've, you've probably, things have happened, disagreements have happened, and you've what you call swept it under the carpet, and you've built up this wall, and over the years that, that thing's getting bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes a big, wall, big brick wall. You can't see each other anymore, you just see the wall, the issues. And so anything you say to each other you're going to blast and you're going to go off because basically all is you now see the issues. And it's easy to build a wall up, but it's a lot harder to take it down again. But it's possible. That's what we're saying. It is possible. 
And what it's saying here, we need proper maintenance, but the most people don't just go to a garage, find a pair of pliers and pull out the tooth. Mm -hmm. Reason tells us to go to the dentist who has been trained to repair cavities in teeth, that's like the counsellor, and get the necessary professional help to repair and save the tooth. The same needs to happen in marriage. Mm. So what we are saying is there is hope. And I don't know if there may be people out there listening now. And we've had it. We've seen it, haven't we, done one in marriage weekends. We've seen couples come. I can see it goes the other way sometimes. I'm not saying it doesn't. But I have seen situations where couples have come. And it's almost like their last chance saloon. Mm. After this, I'm, that's it, I'm, I'm going. I'm going my separate ways. And because of some encouragement and support and some counselling which is offer, we have seen miracle stories mm. where things have been turned around. And I will also say, even if people reach the point where that is it, still go and seek some counselling. Because you still need to become whole in your own self. To just go away and think, I'm going to end up going into another relationship, it's going to work, it won't. You need to heal. And that's why it's important to have some support and that's why it's important to seek support and this is why we mentioned these these areas um one of the other um areas <coughs> i guess <coughs> which can come yes maybe as a result of divorce but it's it just happens sometimes because you know you know this is where this is the society this is the life we are in is we talk about the broken family, the impact on, on, on children living with a one in a one-parent household. How how does that look like? What what is, what is that really like? Um, just the impact of being a single parent. How do you deal with that? Because this is now looking, we focus it off from the couple to the actual children themselves. Um, and I know, Natalia, you've done some work, haven't you, in this area. I don't know if you've ever found anything yourself, you know, with couples or, or individuals you've had to work with who may be in, you know, in the, in the single. Yeah, like the point that I was making earlier um, about becoming more emotionally available for your children or, like, getting the help for yourself so you can be emotionally available for your children. Because like I was saying, when you're going through that, um, it's very hard for you to take on everything. Like I was saying, paying the bills, keeping on top of the house, trying to keep a devotional life with the kids. Literally, it's like you've become the priest of the household as well. Like you've taken on all these responsibilities. It is very hard for you to be emotionally available. But that's why for me personally, I, I truly do believe in counseling. I think it's a place where you can go that is confidential like um, Sister Delavon was saying, without people necessarily talking your business, it's a place where you can go, go and explore and go and heal so that you can be the best for your children. And spend that time with Jesus. Sit down at his feet, cry, weep to the Lord. Like, let him just help you to just, you know, heal and feel better and just keep him close as your husband until, you know, whatever happens happens that that is literally the best advice I could I could give and that's the advice that I give to my clients like you're doing the right thing by getting the help you're helping yourself you're helping your children you're helping everyone around you so to me that's what I would say yeah I was just going to say that um, some relationships are so damaged mm -hmm. that they are just damaging mm -hmm. the children that are in them and sometimes we can think it is the best for them to stay together mm -hmm. and actually they need to separate mm -hmm. because they're damaging the children um, in their efforts to stay together. They're actually damaging the children. Uh, okay. So what's happening within the children is, is, is I would have said, fear. So m my, my background is that my parents 
uh, non-Adventists, and they, they got divorced when I was around about 14 years old. But we had years and years of the infighting and the, the difficulties and domestic violence. We had years of it. And to the point where I remember as a child praying for them to get divorced. I remember sitting and asking God if he could sort that out for us. That's how bad it was. We were fearful, fearful to go to sleep. We heard an argument. We would jump up thinking, what, what, you know, do I need to go and protect my mother? What, you know, what, what needs to happen? So we have to realize that children are sensitive beings and that they then have to go through that. And then, as has uh, already been said, they have to then form their own relationships yeah. later on. Yeah. And that's the picture that, that they've had. Some people, some children go think, well, I'll never get married because that is the picture of marriage that they've had. Yeah. Or if they do get married, that is what their marriage, marriage will be characterized by. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to think that marriages should, you know, you work at a marriage and it stays together. But there are some people who probably should never ever have gotten married and should never ever have had those children. God can work if you're both open to it. God can work, but as adults, we shouldn't make that at the expense of the health and well-being of the children. Um, I, I think that's a very good point, Jean. I just want to clarify, oh, before oh, pass that yet. Yeah, um, one thing I think is important to, make, to mention as well, sometimes people are in abusive relationships. And this is one thing we do say as family life educators, don't stay where it's not safe. Mm. Now that might mean t total separation, it may end up that way, but it, it also at least means coming out of the household for your safety. Yeah. Because if you stay in that situation, you are putting yourselves at risk and the children at risk. And by abuse, it can sometimes be physical and sometimes it can be emotional. But those are situations which are real and they need some special intervention and help. And I just want to put that out there as a, as a caveat. Sorry, Dr. Aki. No, I was just going to add to uh, what Natalia was saying. Um, in terms of, of, of children and parents getting counselling, the, well, one of the, the big challenges that, that single parents have is the, the sense of guilt and shame. Um, and I think it's important for them to be able to, to get counseling so that they can, in a sense, forgive themselves where they feel that they have failed their children. And um, there's a one author who, who said something which I think is key. Uh, she said that, Children don't need perfect parents. They need good enough parents. So we do the best that we can, and we, we rely on God to fill in the, the, the gaps that, that we can't fill. And we do our best to, to bring people into the, the atmosphere of our children who can exert positive influences on them. But it's important for us to, to cut ourselves some slack. Um, if we are single parents, um, we do the best that we can. We, we cannot be perfect. Hi. Um, I'd like to ask the panel this question. When we consider the divorce rates in the world, why is it then that the church almost has a similar divorce rate? Is it could it be seen, interpreted, that marriage, as we know it, is, is a complex relationship anyway, and is it really sustainable? You may say that one. Um, the idea that the divorce rate is similar within the church and in the general society is actually a fallacy. Um, it was based on some research done by um, a writer or a, uh, a guy called George Barner, who was a, a Christian researcher. And it was done amongst a population who claimed to be Christian, so have a Christian background as opposed to being committed Christians, uh, attending church, and doing Bible studies. Um, what they found was that where 
uh, where couples were actually engaging with church, the divorce rate was, was nothing close to what was going on in society. So it's, it's, a, bit of a, it's a bit of a fallacy. It's not a bit of a fallacy, it's, it's just not true. So a committed relationship with Christ is one of the things that can, can stabilize us and to keep us away from the kind of divorce fallout that we see in the secular society. Absolutely makes a difference. Mm. Just, just to go... Just to go back to um, s something that was mentioned earlier regarding the impact um, with the children. Many, many, many years ago, I made it a commitment that I would like to be the kind of grown-up that I would have had loved to have around me when I was a child. And this is something that I've used where I've been involved working with children, pathfinders and everything else that we do, my wife and I, is a commitment to, re it's that intentional thing where you recognize that there's not always going to be enough role models within the home structures of some of the families that we have in the church. And that missing link, that, that, that person that, the father figure or the, the role model who may not necessarily be in the home, we can, I'm not saying we can replace a, a, a missing father, but we can do something for the young boys as men in the church. We can do something for the missing mother if, it, if that's the case for, for, um, uh, for, for the young ladies in the church where we are very intentional about what, um, how we cater for, for people who have single, single, um, single parent fam families. Now, one of the ways to do that is to do what we're doing now, to really talk about these things and to let it not be um, something that we are ashamed to talk about. Um, because I think when you educate yourselves and when we start to make it a, a normal conversation, it really opens up understanding and it helps the person who is listening, who may be listening here or listening online, to know that there is a place where they can go where people understand what they're going through or at least are willing to understand what they're going through. And also to invite them to share their experience. Let them teach us, the, those who may not have experienced this thing, and, and really give them the platform to say, this is, what, this is how you can be helpful to me. Uh, I'll give you a quick experience. There was a, a lady who, who used to attend church, and her boys, two boys, um, the, the, the father was not in the home, was missing in the home, and um, she, she, she looked to the church, to the men in the church, to really help with those boys to... They were growing up and they didn't have a father figure. And she just wanted somebody to just sort of share some time with them and advise them and just maybe just step in every now and then to, to, to kind of do the things that boys like to do with, you know, um, w they would have loved to do with their father. But she says there was not anyone who was willing to just even show any interest in maybe modeling uh, or even just... Uh, counseling or giving advice or just putting an arm around them to just be there. Now, that was an expectation that she had which was not met and a need, a real need for this family. And these boys ended up leaving the church and they went to uh, a, a, a Muslim, the Muslim faith and there they were surrounded by a group of men who were showing them love and support and hugging them and really giving them, you know, confidence and, and self, you know, self-esteem and everything. It almost felt like this is what they were missing. You know, this, this is what they were looking for and they were dying, they were craving for that. Uh, and so there are, thankfully, many things that are happening within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, within our church structure, which cater for those kind of things. 
and you know, men's ministries, youth ministries, and pathfinding, and different things, family ministries. So it's about having those conversations and having the awareness and being willing to be the kind of person that you yourself would have loved to have around when you were young. And, and just being, the, the, you may not have the answers for what they're going through, but just that willingness to be there, to step in, to invite them for lunch, you know, you mentioned, you know, to invite them for lunch, to invite, to, to invite them for a football match and to, to have a social with the young people, to share some ideas, to have, you know, the, the, the things that we sometimes do with the young people where we, we have smart love seminars and talk about real issues and, and really getting, giving them the, the opportunity to share their experience. Mm. I think that is crucial because it shows that you really care. Even if you don't have the answers, but you care, and I think that's the first step and just having that awareness of this is what's happening within our church. It's not something that's out there. It is a reality that we have presently, uh, and we need to address that. Can I, am I right to the side? Guys, this is why, honestly, you know when you were just speaking, bro, like, this is so true, and this is why, by the grace of God, I started Christ Therapy. God started Christ Therapy, because when I was going through that depression state, I couldn't turn to my family at that time. And I was struggling to connect with Christ at that time. And God really led me to use my skills to be able to go into churches and provide this space, like what we're doing now. But it's a little bit more intimate because it's like we're round in a circle and we'll talk about specific topics. These things are important. And these things, the connection, it's like, Sabbath will come, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath, and that's it, you're right, yeah, you, before, it's just, it's not, guys, I'm sorry, but it's just not real enough, it's not, if we really are a family of God, if we really are going to heaven one day, and having that relationship in heaven with Jesus, um, and we're around our brothers and sisters, we need to really be our brother's keeper here. We need to have these conversations. We need to practically help. Look at this, these poor sons, yeah, who, who my brother was just talking about. They've gone into a mosque and got that help from those men. Look at the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, seeing the man on the floor, seeing that he was wounded, seeing that he was bruised, binded up his wounds. He met his needs. It's the needs of the people, what people need. That's what we need to be helping with. Being practical, he put him on his donkey, he took him to it in, he used his finances, paid. I just feel like there's so much more that we could be doing as a church. And while I've got this opportunity to talk, I just want to just tell the church out there, Christ therapy, yeah, is, it, it, it can be a blessing to many. And I just think we need it because I didn't have it at that time. And... Yeah, therapy is important with Christ. Um, I'd just add to that saying that um, as churches, we should be intentional. Yes. Is we need to be intentional. We've got children. We want to keep the children in the church. We need yes. to be intentional. We've got families. We want families to stay together. We have to be intentional. Mm -hmm. So you've got a church building, praise God. Yes. We should have programs running here, yes. as the brother and sister are saying. Mm -hmm. Programs running here. We need to be intentional that activities are taking place here for our children yes. so that they can socialize together here, that couples can come here, that you can have a couple's evening here and have a dinner upstairs yeah. you, we need to be intentional use the resource that we've got yeah. we are so blessed yeah. to have some of these resources yeah. and if we don't do it for ourselves at the, as the brother has said the muslims were able to attract those children because we're taking our eye off the ball yeah. these programs that we have the family life children's youth we should have a comprehensive plan there should be no time. We actually, our children, our young people, and I was a young person, there was always something happening at church. I was there in the morning, there in the afternoon, at night, on Friday night there was worship. In the week there was something. Then we were all going out. So I didn't have time to go somewhere else because we were doing things in church. Can we say that about our churches at the moment? We need to be intentional. 
Um, some very powerful things have been said and um, our encouragement really, both to you watching online and also to us as a church here, that really individually you need to look at your own church situation. We encourage you to do the family ministry survey. All, of you, all your leaders have it. If not, we can send it to your pastors, your elders, that's fine. Find your local needs in the church. Assess those as the beginning of the or as we are in the year now. Assess where what those needs are. You're not going to be able to do everything, but begin to start a program. Begin that process because that is what will make a difference. I, I know when we attended recently a prayer conference, which we did jointly with prayer ministries, and we had a similar session like this, and people were just sharing. And some deep stuff came out some deep needs but we have a lot of hurting people across our conference and it's only when you create the right atmosphere that things will come and you've got to find ways of ministering the skills are there within the church believe it or not we have a very rich not about finances now in terms of wealth of expertise and skills it's there within our church and we just need to start tapping into it and utilizing it and being effective and as you say Jean be purposeful about what we do. I'm almost hesitant. I can see Mick had his hand up, but I don't know if I want to pass the mic to him. <laughs> Is it okay, Mick? Two minutes? One minute? Because we want to go to the next point, really, now. Yeah, okay. Um, you defend, right. <laughs> Thank you once again. Um, I find it very interesting um, how we have a wonderful panel with a wealth of information. What my concern is, is that do members feel they can talk to us in confidence? I go to work and obviously I get to know my students and they will come and talk to me about their private issues. If we only see our members once a week, as it were, do we really feel comfortable in opening up? Right, I just really want to link on to what Brother Mick has just said in regards to people feeling um, not vulnerable, but feeling comfortable in being able to open up, um, even to the services that you're, you're providing, the counseling service. Of course, it's a, it's a wonderful service. It's, it's very needed, um, especially in the climate where we're having all these different issues going on in regards to family. But the situation is, are we creating a an, an nurturing an environment in our churches where people feel they can open up to, or, you know, open up to our brothers, open up to a sister? Are we in that environment? Um, I would extend a question. You know, you speak in terms of, of leadership. I would extend a question to all of us as a as, uh, membership, are we safe people? Because people are observing us. This is something I shared with, with, with uh, our young ministers a few weeks ago. People are looking at us all the time. They are assessing us. They're thinking to themselves, now if I have an issue, is this somebody who I can feel comfortable sharing my heart with? So we have to present ourselves as safe people. <coughs> Because nobody's going to open up their hearts to somebody who they don't feel safe with. Mm -hmm. So um, it's important for us to, to not just be safe people, but I think the point was made earlier. One of the best things that we can do for anybody who is struggling is simply to ask, mm -hmm. how you doing? Mm -hmm. How you doing? And, 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 and just sometimes to probe a little. Yes. Not... not, 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 not being intrusive, mm. but sometimes we can just say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Mm. Yeah, but, but how are you really? Mm. And we show the interest, mm. and we open up an opportunity to have a conversation. Mm. And I it's important for us to be willing to be vulnerable ourselves. Mm. Because when we open up and share with others, it gives them the permission to do the same thing. I'll share a very quick experience. Uh, wh when I was, um, before I went into ministry, I was working in for the civil service and um, I, I got a job working for the job centre and they put me to work with a lady who, who took an instant disliking to me. 
Now, um, <laughs> I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, the, 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 our bosses put us to work together on the same section. And w as we were working together, the kind of the ice broke. And then she eventually said to me, you know, I said to her, you know, how come you, you took this disliking to me? And she said, you were too happy. <laughs> she said, you're too happy. You know, I got my problems and I come and, 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 and you're smiling all the time. You know, everything <laughs> seems <laughs> hunky dory with you and I wanted to rearrange <laughs> whatever. Um, but it was as I was willing to open up my heart and share with her, and I, I got my own issues too. It's just that I, this is the way I deal with them. And we, we began a friendship that lasted, even after I left, we were, we were in communication for a long time because I was willing to be open and vulnerable with her. And I think we need to do the same thing as church members because people who are suffering want somebody to speak to. Um, can I just jump in very quick here? I got a phone call from a friend who said to me, there's, there's this lady, I work in health and social care, this lady who needs help and, you know, I think, you know, she's got a son who's struggling and um, got learning disabilities and this and the other. I think you would be a great fit for her to work with her as a PA and, and, and the like. Went over to see, uh, the first time, the very first time I went over to see her and she invited me and she was sharing with me what, what it is that she needed help and support with. And then, so we finished the finish conversation. She was lovely, you know, made me a brew, and we call it a brew because I'm up north. It's a cup of tea. And, and so she finished. We, we finished, and, and I'm thinking, right, I'm getting ready to leave. And she says, i tell you why I need help. I've really struggled. And then she starts to lay out what her issues were, and she says, I've really struggled because no one seems to get it. You know, people are just so dropping in and out of my life and, you know, and, and people are not committed and, and this and the other and I've tried to find help and then she, she's saying all these things and then she gets to a point where she says I even, I even look for help from a church she mentioned a church, a local church that she attended um, not a Seventh-day Adventist church um, just in a, she said I even try to find help from a church but even there they let me down now, it, it just dawned on me that she, she was expressing this need to so many different people, and she says, but no one was willing to even take the time to listen to what she was experiencing. She said, even, even the people in the church, and she emphasized that, almost to say that this is the last place I expected that this sort of thing could happen. The, the question is a great question, um, can people feel confident? Should they expect? Yes, they should. They should expect because this, you know, this person who I've just met and is expressing this need, and she said, even in the church, and, and so there is an expectation that, and who is our prime example? Jesus. We look at how he drew people towards himself. Right? We look at his character and how people were drawn towards him. What was it about him? Yes, some people were not happy with that, but, but what was it about Christ that drew people towards him? And those are the sort of things that when we ask those questions, and how are we emulating that character of Christ so that others will be drawn, not to us, but to him through us. Right? And, and I think that's where each one it's not about blaming the church or blaming the pastor or blaming the elders. Or any, each one has that responsibility. All of us. We all have it, that responsibility. The way that, that some person may connect with just you, that may, they may not connect with the next person. And you may be the, the, the one person in that church who becomes the, that, that connection, that network, and that safe space where they can share things and then w through Bible studies and prayer and that connection with you, they are able to find strength in the Lord and then to be able to help somebody else. So, so I think, I think we, we really need to sort of think in our minds, um, you, you don't have to, yes, the, the, this, the, 
the, the, the services that we have and, and everything else and the professionals that we have in the church are crucial. But so is the lay member in the church. So is every single one of us to be on the lookout for that person who just needs that support. Uh, and, and I think it's important that we, we, we are all in that mindset and we, we are intentional about it. And if you are showing that example of Christ, um, help, help somebody along the way and they will be able to then pass that on to somebody else. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Um. We're going to move into our next section slowly now, so I'm going to ask if someone could pass us the question box. And Delavon has a question here already, which came in online from in earlier in the week. But just to reiterate, in, and I think everything what's been said has been really valuable this evening, thank you. Um, but just to reiterate, in regards to the NEC counselling service and even the SEC one, all of those counsellors have to work under a strict confidentiality um, code of ethics that has to happen. So that's, that is the something. The only time, and we, they would always say that in any discussion, is if whatever the person is sharing is of harm to them in terms of abuse, where that would have to be reported to it, that's, uh, but they would explain that at the time when they would have to refer that. But that should be assured because we get asked this question a lot when we go to churches. <laughs> and if that wasn't the case, we would be in problems. I do not know as the family ministries director, the individuals who ring. I will have a report to say you had this number of calls. I don't know where they phoned from. I don't know who they are. <laughs> you, know, the, the, you know, that's how it is. That's how it works. And there's been one or two people who have phoned me directly and I've referred it, you know, but even we ourselves try to off operate within that confidential because you have to and you cannot, once that goes, once trust is gone, you've lost everything. But it is true, um, as a church, we need to build that trust and build those relationships and, and that is crucial. Yeah. Precisely, Dennis, precisely. So, Delamon, can we ask this? There were some questions asked, and we didn't feel we was able to answer them as fully, so we did say we'll come back to it. So I think Delamon has one here the panel might like to look at. Okay, so I'm just going to read what we have here. I am going through a family crisis with my brother. My brother used to work when he was younger, but since he joined the church, he does not want to work. He has done agency work a few times in the past. The benefit people have sanctioned his benefit and cut off his benefits. Me and my dad have been giving him money and my dad is getting stressed and depressed by my brother's behavior. If me and my dad do not check in, to see if he needs food and money, he half starves himself until he is losing weight and looking unkempt. I have tried to persuade him to go to his GP to get CBT or talking therapy, and I have even sent him the SDA counseling mobile number. I sent him Neil Nedley depression program to try and help him. I sent him links such as Mind and Every Mind Matters, Depression UK, Mental Health Crisis links. He is in denial. He does not think anything is wrong with him. He has had his benefit money cut off four times. He told me that he does not want to sign back on to get benefits. Me and my dad are feeling the pressure. I just wanted some guidance if I should, of who I should contact. Adult social services to report him as a vulnerable adult, should I do that? I plan to visit him soon next week to try and encourage him in person to talk to someone. He said he used the food bank a couple of times. 
I am not sure what else I can do. In my job, I am a family support worker, helping to reduce the conflict between families. Um, I do a program called... No, okay. Okay, I have been praying and fasting for him, but that is not enough. Their family have just been throwing money at him, but not dealing with his problem. So I think they're really wanting some support here. What advice can you give to this person? Um, it's a long question, so I, I did see it before, so I had to make some notes, because it's actually quite detailed. So um, I'm praying that this person is listening to this, and we want to thank them at the outset for the support that they're giving to their loved one, mm -hmm. because it's not an easy area. Mental health is not easy. There are no quick fixes, and it will take time and perseverance, and your praying, which is essential in this situation. You're already doing the right thing in providing basic support and basic care, and you need to continue to do that. There are too many examples. There's one here in Nottingham where someone estranged themselves from their family and it was, and their benefit was cut off. And it was months and months before they found the person deceased because they'd ended all contact. So we, we have to take these things seriously. Yes, you should go to the GP. Now, the problem you'll have with the GP, or not the problem as such, but the parameters that a GP works within is confidentiality. Um, they cannot breach your brother's confidentiality. But that does not mean that you cannot go to the GP and raise your concerns. They will go directly to the individual. They won't necessarily come back and feed back to you, because if, particularly if the person doesn't want them to. Um, but you've raised it. The other thing I would do is um, I would keep a chronology of these behaviours, a, a diary should we say, over a period of time. So you're not just telling them this, this, and this, but you can identify the, the dates and, and the times and things, and that's going to be really helpful in the long run as well. Some areas that you live in will have a team called an at-home team, and they work with people who are demonstrating some kind of mental health disturbances, but in their own homes. Many of us will have heard of the crisis team. Crisis teams team to, tend to get involved where it's of a, more, a higher level. Um, at the moment, your brother is, is not communicating and he's demotivated. So he probably wouldn't quite fit within the crisis team at this stage, but up at home team he might do and the GP may have access to that. So um, it, it's worth you kind of con considering. I've talked about us building a picture to understand the challenges. Your brother could be experiencing hallucinations or delusions, which might be why he has this reluctance. He may feel or believe that he's been told you shouldn't go to work. I have a family member, um, an extended family member, who is experiencing uh, uh, delusive thoughts and believes that he was being spoken to. And prior to that, he was operating within the family and in the environment. So that can happen to people who are living in their own homes. Don't think that these things only happen to people who are being treated in hospital. Depression can uh, hallucinations and delusions in severe depression can show themselves. So we tend to associate hallucinations, delusions with people who are psychotically ill. But somebody who is very depressed can have those same symptoms as well. And we talked earlier about men and depression. And this is a, this is a man and he's suffering from depression. And men historically uh, do struggle to access services. So it's often said about men, when men become depressed, um, they don't verbalize it and they can um, deteriorate quite quickly. Um, and that deterioration can be quite severe and could lead to suicidal thoughts or ideas. So we have to take it seriously um, in terms of, of treatment. You asked whether or not you should contact social care to report the person as a vulnerable adult. Anyone can make a re re referral to social care for a child or for an adult. 
So you've definitely got nothing to lose doing that. I definitely would do it. All they can do is come back to you and say, well, they're not going to take any action. But that in itself provides you with a record of the concerns, the concerns you've listed and the fact that you've raised them with social care and the fact that you've been to the GP. Mm -hmm. and then if there's another episode, you've got all of that to feedback and actually it would be very difficult to ignore your concerns there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's also important to recognise that uh, what has been expressed so far is you have done everything possible um, for your brother and you feel like nothing that you have done has really helped them. Um, you may not realise that straight away, but it's actually, as has been mentioned, that is all the right things to do. Um, one thing I would just add to, to that is you need to make sure that you've also got support for yourself because, you know, you, you mentioned that you, money is being given and you're constantly doing these and, and you don't want to get to a point where you, you, you're bent out and you, you're just ready to give up and, and throw, everything, um, you throw everything out. So I, it's important to, for you to also make sure that you're getting the right kind of support for yourself so that you are in the right frame of mind to think clearly about the decisions that you're making and the steps that you need to, because the, it could be a long process. It could be a short process, but it could be a long process, and you don't want, you don't want that to go on and end up affecting your own mental health and your own well-being. So just make sure that there is uh, the right support for yourself as well um, while you're trying to help your, your brother. Okay. Yeah, go on. Yeah. One of the organisations, thank you, that's a really good point. One of the organisations you could approach for support is MIND because they have a support system for, for uh, relatives and carers, don't they? Um, so they're, they're quite good. There are other, there are other um, s more specific mental health services in some of the towns. So often there's an, uh, an, an Asian black mental health service, maybe a, a black mental health service in, 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 in your area as well. So um, it may well be you could get some help from those areas. Okay. This way, please. Does it? Okay, yeah. Um, thank you, thank you for those answers. We, we're really at the end now, because we haven't got any more questions apart from this one, have we, the other one? Yeah. Is that the one? Okay, so the, the last question we had, which may be a bit similar, well, perhaps a different thing anyway, because this came in online as well, I think. I, if you have a family member who has a mental health issue and you have told them to go to their GP, but they still refuse to go and get support, what else can be done to help them? It looks like, I think it's a similar question. It's so I think hopefully it's been answered. I'm hoping you, you received your answers to, um, or at least partly, by all means approach us and we could refer you to some services as well. I hope, I hope that's helped. Dennis, did you have a? Okay, um, it, it is true we need the Lord in everything, and that is so true. Um, but we also do need to ex accept that sometimes because of certain medical conditions, you know, things can happen to people, and they do need some help, and that's, that is needed. So, you know, it, it's, a mi it's a combination of, of support that has to be put into pl in place. Pastor, yes. 
I didn't know. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I just saw somebody sig signal me back there, so I wondered if there was a comment. To but just a very quick point on uh, on yeah. that. We have to be careful not to equate what the yeah. Bible talks about in terms of depression with yeah. clinical depression, yeah, that's what because I'm there saying. are very clear parameters um, to to identify what's clinical depression, and we, you know we can't go back two thousand years and diagnose people. So um, the Bible does give good principles, and we've touched on some of them throughout the week in what what. Um, helps us to maintain um, good mental health. And one of those things is, or the most important thing is, uh, our relationship with God. But that doesn't mean that, you know, it, the realities of life can, can result in, in people experiencing mental health issues that may be um, for uh, physical reasons, it may be uh, circumstantial reasons. Um, it is a reality. Um, but you're right, our, our relationship with God is an important component of, of a healing process. Amen. Um, what we are going to do now before we go just to our final prayer time to conclude, we every evening, um, Dr. Aki, we've been praying for the various topics we've been discussing that evening. And, and it's been a bit of a mix, I know, um, today, but we're going to have a, a, a prayer time. I don't want to put anyone under pressure on the panel here. I don't know if anybody has a burning statement they want to make to sort of say you you can free to do so if not we can just close this section now um, um i thought i'd just say uh, a few things about the counseling service um we we have a team of counselors uh, as um pastor has said you access that through the telephone line you'll be an allocated to a counselor now you will not be allocated to a counsellor in the area who is in the area that you live because that person may well know you so um, so you, you'd be allocated that counsellor uh, the counsellor will um, talk to you as an individual most of the sessions are either on Microsoft Teams or Zoom or over the telephone and you agree uh, that the, the person will agree with the counsellor about how you proceed you um, have a contract, so it's all very professional. There is actually a counselling contract and you agree. And there's some parameters in the, in the counselling contract about how you work together. You will work with a client over a period of time. Um, and you do keep records, but those records are confidential. And the client's name is not attached to the records anywhere. The records are kept paper records, so there's nothing electronic stored on anyone. And the, the records are for your use as a therapist to remind you where you are in the work that you're doing, but they're not for sharing. You never, dis you never share your records with your supervisor. And all of us as um, therapists are supervised about the work that we, we undertake. The uh, client can end the therapy at any point that they want to end it. Uh, it's entirely up to them. Or if they... Um, find that for whatever reason they don't gel with you as a therapist, then we can go back and that person can be allocated to somebody else. I just thought it might help to sort of understand the context in which we work as therapists. Uh, you, there is a small fee, I think it's about £21 now for uh, a session, but bearing in mind that in the world, yeah, you're talking about 55 to £60 pounds an hour normally for a therapist i work privately as well and that's the that's that's how much i would charge so um i think it's it's a good service you there, there are qualified experienced therapists um and you will not know the therapist that will be speaking to you can i just, just a quick um, add on to that uh, i think it's an important point that some people uh, experience counseling and they don't necessarily gel with the counsellor, and as a result, they say, oh, well, counselling doesn't work for me. Um, it's a relationship. So if it doesn't work with one person, it may well work with somebody else. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater if, if you don't gel with one counsellor. Um, persist. Many years ago, my wife and I sought counseling and it 
literally saved our marriage. Amen. And initially, I was very reluctant. Um, my wife is sat here at the, at the back. She'll tell you I, I'm a stubborn man, and she'll be right. I was very, I, I was very skeptical, and I, I just didn't want anybody knowing our business. What, what right do we have, you know, do they have knowing what we're going through? We're going to sort this out ourselves. But the, 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 the way that I was thinking at the time, the, even the thought process, the, the, the sort of the mentality and the approach that we had towards all sort of a whole host of things that we're going through, that processing was not clear. It was not there. And just the energy to deal with the everyday things was not there. Mm. It was somebody else outside that, and it was good to see uh, uh, Karen and Benny Holford, who was, we were working with at the time and who just really helped us. And every time I see her and I remind her of that, and I al we always thank, thank her for it and thank them for that support because it was really, really crucial Sometimes we all need help. We just need, and my brother mentioned about, you know, how do you balance that out with scripture? Well, God has blessed individuals. God comes through. The, you know that song that we sing, you know, where his hands and his feet and his, his, his voice? I don't know if you know this song. But God would send help through individuals, and he has blessed us with a wealth of talent and professionals within our church who not only bring um, just counseling for the sake of counseling, but holistic, you know, healing. And our relationship with God is very much impacted with, uh, by our mental, um, our mental health. And if we can have somebody to come alongside us and help us to process things clearly and help us to get back on our feet, and then restore that relationship, not just our relationship with God, but with our spouses and our families. Mm -hmm. That is altogether a good thing. And so there is help. Um, if there is somebody who's watching, who's struggling, don't feel that you're on your own. Mm -hmm. Don't suffer in silence. Mm -hmm. There is help. And, and I'm really pleased with the way that this thing has been put on for this week because it's, it's a very kind and gentle approach to the reality, the harsh reality of what many of us are experiencing. Mm -hmm. And it's about time that we don't feel that if I come forward, I'm gonna get judged or people are gonna talk about my business and, and all these different things. No, just step forward mm -hmm. because it could literally save your life. Okay, so we're now going to go into a prayer session and I'm um, going to ask um, Dr. Aki is going to go and give us a prayer to close off this section. And then we're going to do the final vote of thanks and then our theme song and we will end for the evening. Can I invite us all to stand together? Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and for your grace. We thank you for allowing us this opportunity to come together as your children to discuss these, these very important issues. And I pray, dear Lord, if there are folks who are here or folks who are online who are touched by some of the issues that we have discussed, that you will give them the support that they need. Bring the right people into their presence. Signpost them. Guide them to where they need to go. But most importantly, Lord, be there for them. May they, by your spirit, experience peace within their hearts. May they experience healing. May they experience um, the, the comfort of your presence. Father God, those who uh, have, have been through uh, divorce, we've spoken about this evening, who may be pain is still raw. No matter how long the time has passed, maybe they're still uh, struggling with the various issues. And I pray, Father God, that you will be their, their companion, be the, the one who is uh, there to provide the comfort and the, the solace and, the, and the, um, the companionship which they need. I pray that you will be with the children who are adversely impacted um, by divorce. We know that uh, we cannot prevent the hurt and the pain 
from separation, but Lord, you can provide a healing environment for those children to grow in a healthy way. And I ask, dear Lord, that you will be with those couples who have gone through the experience of divorce, that give them um, hearts that are uh, that are open to to reconciliation, even if they don't decide to get back together. Help them to be able to treat one another with love and respect so that the, the impact of, of the, the pain of divorce is not compounded. I pray, Father God, that you will be with those who are struggling with, with mental ill health and the families who struggle along with them. Uh, we pray, dear Lord, that you will once again provide the help that is needed. Guide them to where they can get that help. Um, those families who are struggling, like some of those who we've heard today, who have this pain and the burden within their hearts, seeing their loved ones suffer, I ask, Father God, that you will comfort them, give them strength, and give them hope for the future. I help them not to cease to, to uh, intervene and to, to intercede um, on behalf of their loved ones. And I pray, dear Lord, that you will work the miracle because you are powerful, Lord. You are strong. You are mighty. There is no problem that we can bring to you that you cannot um, solve. And so, Father God, we simply place all of these various issues in your hand and we ask you to work them out according to your purpose. Give us even more reasons to praise you and to thank you as we see you working mightily in the lives of of your children. So Father God, we thank you for what has taken place this week, the various presentations that have been given, the issues that have been addressed, the solutions that people have found. And I thank you for the, the leadership of, of Pastor Francis and Delavon and everybody who has been part of, of this week. And I pray that the impact of this week uh, through the recordings and YouTube will will uh, last and go, f go further and further and further. So we thank you, Father God, for the ministry that has taken place here this week. We thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for what you are doing. And we thank you for what you promised to do for us in the future. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, um, just want to make a thank you to all our panelists as well for, for helping in this last session we did. And we have really reached the end of our program. But what we'd like to do is customary, you know, to give a thank you because this program couldn't have happened without support, even to the point of providing our meals and helping us. You know, we had, we had Robert and Sharon who helped a couple of days and today as well, both of them today providing for all the teams and also keeping us well fed and watered, as they said. We want to thank them for that. We want to thank also our media team for all the help that they have given us to make this possible. And our musicians, um, soloists, and the whole range. So you're going to... You want yes. to mention some names of the one? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I uh, would really love to. I know some people aren't here, so we're going to get these yeah, little cards to definitely. them. But um, we want to thank initially um, Pauline Liburd for organizing um, the rota for this week in the way of people to play the piano and for um, people to come and lead our praise and worship time. So thank you so much, Pauline. We want to especially thank Kay. Kay, can you come forward for us, please? Because I'm going to give you Andrew's card. Kay and Andrew. Our singer in Israel. Okay. <laughs> I really thank you both for coming. Not only did you play, but you also sang so beautifully. So we really appreciate that. And if you could pass on Andrew's, Andrew the card for him for us. But we really appreciate what you have done in supporting um, us Thank this week. Much. God Thank bless you. you. Thank you very much. And while we're on the musicians, um, 
Um, Kelly, we're going to say thank you to you um, for coming. And for... And Leon. Leon, can you come down and just collect this for us? I know Sean, I think Sean is... Sean was here, might be upstairs and getting some was, more food. Uh, there was well, never mind. There was Sharon. There was I'm gonna give I'm <laughs> gonna give these to you, Kelly, to make sure they get to the right hands. Because we're not necessarily gonna be here. Um sorry. Um we have um Ainsley, we have Devon and Michelle. You know, Michelle prayed for us, Devon led our song service. We have Jaden and Mackenzie. We really mm. appreciated. There were just two young children, but they came and they led the song service and they also gave a special item. So if I can give you those, can I trust you to give it to the... <laughs> You're not going to lose them. <laughs> but thank you so much. We really appreciate you both coming and supporting us. God bless you. Thank you, Kelly. Oh, Kelly. Rachel Francis. I'm sorry if I <laughs> loaded you down. Rachel Francis has been a star with coming and um, leading out. Thank you. And can I just ask um, Ken and Jean, can you come forward, please? We really appreciate you both. Um, you've been here, if not, I think it was more or less every single night you were here. <laughs> and Jean, not only did you sing, but you led out um also with a special item you also prayed as well um ken we thank you for supporting the program and and being a part of it so thank you so much for your ministry to us this week um now i did see mick he was just there where did he go don't worry about it. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll get him later. Well, I, I'll have to. He's probably pass scared. His he's going to be called on again, Delamont. Um, <laughs> is is Kathleen still here? No. Oh, that's okay. all right. We can we can get those to her. Um, we also now need to mention. Um, okay. Uh, now let me just give. Yeah, Pastor. Joe Philpot, can you come here for us, please? I, I know, Pastor Philpot, it's been a big sacrifice a big this amen. week. Can he was only originally supposed to be here for a couple of days and come back, and I know the team members couldn't, wasn't all able. We want to thank you, Joe, for, for everything you've done, man. And yeah, I know, definitely. God bless you, because you weren't well. I wasn't well. I'm feeling, I, every day, as the days have gone on, I've been feeling stronger and better, um, but you were so not well. But you know, he came, he was still here early and then he was leaving late and then I know when you got home, you were still doing stuff. We thank you so much for what you've done. We want to thank your team. So I'm just going to, so that's for you. Can you just, I don't know how to pronounce their names, but their names, yeah, can you say their names? Kiza, Marby, Eddie, Donnie, Lyndon. You guys want to come to the front as well and collect your? Yeah, they can't. <laughs> doing the media. If, if there's people are watching and and all the computers <laughs> stop working, they, they they know why. <laughs> they can have the fifteen seconds of fame. No, no, guys, it's been wonderful. You know, you've made it possible, and we do appreciate. We 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 do appreciate. Amen. Thank you so all. So it's a we dynamic really team. <laughs> <laughs> we really do appreciate everything God you have you done guys. for this week. You've been fabulous. The work you've put in, the time and effort, we really appreciate it. Thank you all so very much. God bless you all. We look forward to seeing you on other programs. Definitely, because we've got <laughs> other things planned, don't we? <laughs> Thank you so much. Can we just give him another hand? <laughs> And we would like... Mm. I'd like especially to, to ask Pastor Dan and his family just to come forward at this moment in time because I'd like if we could do a, a special prayer for them. Um, Pastor Dan... Yes, no, yes. Pastor Dan... We need to come here. I want to I say something to you as um, a church and I can say this now because I'm the position I'm in at this moment in time. We need to value our ministers. 
And you have a minister here who is one in a million. I have watched him come, you know, every day so early, Mm. open up, stay with us till sometime, Mm. 11 o'clock till we've all gone, and come back again the next day. Yes. Faithfully, faithfully, and that says something. And I I want to apologize to his dear wife and his daughter. (laughs) Because I know this week, particularly with it being Valentine's Day as well, you know, you haven't seen much of your husband this week. And I'm just praying you get some time off because you need that as well. <laughs> you go home at night. <laughs> but praise God. But I um, want to say God bless you both. Um, I'm going to try and see if we can work something to give your family a little treat from the family ministry department. But we're going to work something on this. But I want to continue to pray. Can we just come and have a prayer with you, please? Um, you know, God needs, we need to pray for our ministers and their relationships that God will also keep them. Not only to have the energy, yeah? And, oh yeah, Eddie, Eddie. Wait, I just realized Eddie, <laughs> Eddie, Eddie um, has had a very learning week, haven't you, Eddie? <laughs> Doing all this te- technical stuff, but the whole family, we need to continue to keep them in prayer because ministry is a challenge but it's also a joy. And we need to protect our ministers that they're not only in their relationship, but in everything God can. I'm going to ask Pastor uh, as well if you can come and we can just have a prayer for them as a family that God will continue to lead and guide and bless and bless their relationship as well as their ministry here in, in this part of the vineyard. Amen. Let's just bow our heads together and pray. Our Father in heaven, we delight to do your will. We thank you for for Dan and his family. We thank you that he's no longer a stranger, that he belongs to us because he belonged to you first. And the joy of the Lord is his strength. I just want to pray for him and for his wife and his children. Lord, bind them together with those cords of love because we know that the enemy of souls will be doing everything in his power to unwind that trinity. But with God and with them, together in your heart, they will not fail. Mm. We think of Paul who said, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Anoint them with your spirit continue to provide for their every need and we know that they will give you the honor and the glory and the praise and we as sheep under his hand lord may we be willing to do as you point him to lead us that we may walk in paths of righteousness for your name so bless them and keep them Make your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon them and grant you, grant them your peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with them now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless all of you. Keep strong. Keep faithful. Amen. colleague, Dr. Les Aki, we want to thank you. I know in your busy schedule, you've given the time to come today and not only present to us, but stay with us for the day. And you've got a long drive back. We want to thank God for your ministry and the way the Lord has continued to use you. And we just pray God will continue to give you strength and a blessing, please. Okay, as it is customary to say, keep hoping, 
keep trusting because God can make a way. Let us stand together. As we pray and sing our theme song. As is always the case, whoever is the main organiser is never or sometimes isn't thanked for all of their hard work that goes in to making these sorts of programmes happen. And, and to Pastor and, and Mrs. Francis, I don't know about you, but I know that a lot of people have been blessed over the course of the week through their various different presentations and programs and the ministry and music, and it's just been a wonderful time. And you've thanked all of us for our hard work, but we want to make sure that we also thank you for your hard work. And we know that in the kingdom of heaven, there are plenty of stars that will be added to your crown for your hard work that's gone into to this week. And you recognize that I've been a little bit under the weather this week, but I know that that wasn't just me. And uh, I'm sure on behalf of all of us this afternoon, we also want to express our appreciation for, you, for the ministry of both of you this week. May God continue to bless you both. Thank you. Let us bow our heads together. Gracious Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for your grace and your mercy and love and thank you for this week that we have spent together, um, both physically here in church and online, for the messages that we have been shared. But let it not be, Lord, just a message that we have heard, but let it be applied to our individual lives. I want to pray especially for each family here represented in this auditorium today. And for each family listening, both now and when we listen later on online, I want to pray, Lord, that you will put a hedge around them, bless them, provide for them. Mm. And Lord, help them to get that close walk with you and in everything to seek you as their God, as their Savior and their King. And with those challenging situations, Lord, help them to work through those situations and realize that help is always on its way and that you, Lord, want the best for them, both in their relationships and you want to bring healing and restoration and peace. And most of all, Father, you want to take us to those your kingdom. And Lord, we just want to pray now as we sing this final song, we stand here together, that we truly may stand together as a family and be ready to hail you as our God and our Savior when you shall break through the clouds of glory is our prayer now in Jesus' name. Amen. And just before you forget, at the end there are some drinks and some cakes still left, so feel free to come upstairs and have a little bite before you go off. God bless. Thank you.
as we'll say.